pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey, fellow travelers on Good morning to all of you. We're glad that you could join us uh, today. Oh, I better introduce myself first. I'm Len Baclar, and together with my wife, Rainey, we are regional advocates in the classes you're on. Also, currently, I am the chair of Disability Concerns Canada. Today, we have the third presentation of the October series walking alongside caregivers. This was, this series was originally planned as a whole day conference to be held last April. That didn't happen, of course. So here we are online. Two weeks ago, we started the series with Robin Smart. She led us in caregiver self-care. Her presentation certainly hit the mark and much of this is available on the Disability Concerns website. Last week, Jack Vanderveer talked to us about ambiguous and complicated grief and how that relates to the caregiver and also what we, we as community can offer in a way of support. And we're thanked too that Cindy and J Julie did a neat rendition of this meaningful song, the servant song. And to continue on with our devotions, I want to introduce Jenna Hoff. Jenna loves her family, a husband and children, and they, come, they live in Edmonton, Alberta, and attend Inglewood CRC there. To overcome her disability, Jenna uses Toby Dynafox assistive technology communication device. This is basically a machine that turns text into speech. Jenna is a writer and editor. She is currently the co-editor of the newsletter that Disability Concerns Canada puts out several times a year. Jenna finds joy in God's spectacular creation. 
And despite the challenges that she faces, Jenna is passionate about using her God-given gifts, and she has many. And she has a strong sense of perseverance and purpose, and this helps her to achieve some wonderful goals. I'm just going to turn it over to you now, Jenna. Hello. I am so glad to be able to spend some time with you today sharing something God has been teaching me of late. Recently, I've been contemplating the concept of solace and what it means to experience solace while facing deep storms of life. Solace is defined as comfort or consolation in a time of distress or sadness and in the midst of a year that continues to be very challenging. Solace is something I yearn for. Maybe you yearn for it too. I've come to the point where my heart is crying out for solace while in the midst of times that for my family have been very difficult. The year for us has not only included a global pandemic, but also the loss of two very close family members on my side and the recent terminal cancer diagnosis of the birth mother of my young adult kids as well as other significant challenges. I live with physical disabilities and a condition that causes severe chronic pain, and my husband and I are caregivers and legal guardians to both our young adults who live with mild to moderate developmental cognitive and emotional disabilities and who joined the family when they were 10 and 20 years old. Shepherding them through the losses and pain of this year in a way they can understand and process their feelings and yet still feel safe and secure has been both a heavy responsibility and a great honor. Many days are not easy and on one such day a few weeks ago, I was at the end of my robe. I'd spent all day frantically working on a work project with a tight deadline and finally finished it around 9 p.m. I was apprehensive as the next morning we were getting up to drive our young adults to visit their birth mother in a park because of COVID, knowing that with her terminal diagnosis there might not be many opportunities for them to see her ever again. Both our young adults were in a devastated and fearful state too and emotions were running high in our house. Shortly after I exhaustedly finished my work and sent it off to my client, my husband opened the mail and found a statement from one of our young adults' bank accounts. To our horror, we discovered our young adult had been coached by a scammer he had met over the internet on how to address an envelope and send checks worth thousands of dollars from his disability savings through the mail. It is one of those things that I am sure most of us who care for vulnerable adults or children deeply fear, that they will be taken advantage of or harmed by strangers. And, now it had happened in our home. In that moment, I was overwhelmed by so much emotion. I felt exhaustion, hurt, fury, anger, overwhelmed, and deep sadness. Once again, I felt utterly unequipped for this calling God has bestowed on my husband and I am being caregivers to two young adults who have diversities and are vulnerable. I'm sure that if we are all honest, most of us as caregivers can relate to emotions such as exhaustion, discouragement, sadness, hurt, and even anger at times. We are all human and to carry the responsibility of providing care to another is not always an easy task, is it? And then, on that hard night, as I faced such a cataclysm of emotions, suddenly the words of Psalm 46 verse 10 came to me. Be still and know that I am God. And suddenly, in the deepest part of my spirit, I calmed down. I felt deep solace swell inside of me. In the weeks since that night, we've continued to face unprecedented challenges. And yet, I've continued to feel a deep sense of peace. When things have been hardest, I have centered my heart and mind on that concept, that I can simply be still and know that he is God and he will go before me. 
it is incredibly comforting to know that the God who calms the storm walks beside us and before us and within us. Finding solace has challenged me to seek rest, to seek out in carve out times to unwind, go into nature and connect with the natural beauty of God's earth, to take time to laugh sometimes and cry other times. Most of all, in the midst of all the swirling chaos and joys of our lives, to find the time to be still and know that he is God. Being a caregiver is rarely an easy task, but it is a way to live out our calling as Christ's followers, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And, when we are still and know that he is God, even in the midst of all the crises and challenges and struggles, we can find solace, comfort, rest, and peace. Thank you. Trust and hope that all of us will be encouraged with those words, be still and know that I am God and that he still continues to provide. It is now also my pleasure to introduce Brenda de Jong. Today's session is about siblings of people with disabilities. Brenda is a, retired from a 30 year career in healthcare. She continues to volunteer in different capacities, which included being a board member of the local community living association and also volunteering in various positions at her church in Port Perry, Ontario where she currently serves as elder and church advocate for disability concerns. Brenda is passionate about pastoral care and has taken courses in lay pastoral visitor through Lake Ridge Health in Oshawa and the Salvation Army. Much of her time is also spent on supporting her sister and an aging father. Brenda serves on the Board of Disability Concerns Canada, where she is vice chair. Brenda enjoy, enjoys time with her children and grandchildren. She and her husband have also enjoyed some major hiking trips to such places as the Grand Canyon, Peru, and Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. She also enjoys many other hobbies, and finds time even to spend some time with friends. And Brenda, I just want to turn this over to you now and go for it. Thank you, Len. Hello, and thank you for coming today. I'm here to share my experience of growing up with a sibling with a disability. When I agreed to give this presentation, I ordered a copy of the book, Views from Our Shoes, Growing Up with a Brother or Sister with Special Needs. Perhaps you're familiar with the book, a book that features children from ages four to 18 sharing their thoughts on having a sibling with a disability. I dove in, expecting to see my experience reflected there. After reading a dozen or so stories, I put the book down and decided I didn't really want to tell my story. The stories in the book are lovely. Children tell how much they love their sibling. Yes, there are bits of sadness or confusion, but what I read was an overwhelming feeling of love, acceptance, friendship, and appreciation. I felt that my story was peppered with things that are not very lovely resentment, anger, self-pity, and even the desire to be an only child. An only child gets more presents, they get the new clothes, and they even go on trips. As I thought these thoughts and they tossed around in my head, I put the whole idea away and rested. I decided to not think about it for a while. In doing that, God worked. He spoke to me through my husband, the only person I dared to share these thoughts with. God nudged and tugged and whispered in my mind. 
When I picked up the book again some weeks later, I could see some of the feelings I had experienced reflected in some of the kids' stories and decided to try again. I am one of four, used to be five kids, and I am in the middle. My sister Erica is the eldest, and when she was an infant, she became sick with encephalitis, an infection of the brain, and spent several months in Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. When she was discharged, she was sent home with an unknown prognosis. The doctors were quite certain Erica was blind and that she could hear, but the full extent of the damage to her brain would only become evident as she grew and developed. Along with being blind, Erica has epilepsy, a developmental disability, short-term memory loss, and areas of keen intelligence. As with most people living with a brain disability, her brain function cannot be labeled or fit neatly into a box that tells you exactly how to manage or what to expect. My earliest memories of life with Erica is an acceptance that she has special needs and that our family did things differently because of that. I don't remember it being a big deal. In fact, I don't have many memories of my early childhood and rely on pictures and stories told by our parents and relatives. I remember seeing Erica have seizures and though they looked very scary, our parents assured us that they were not harmful to Erica, except if she hurt herself crumpling to the ground. We learned that seizures were a normal part of Erica's life. We moved often when I was a child, often for Erica, and starting at a new school became harder and harder for me. I became shy and uncertain. When I was quite young, we moved from Aylmer, Ontario to the outskirts of Chicago, Illinois, so Erica could attend Elam Christian School. It was a difficult time for Erica and for my parents. The first year of school, Erica went to board at Elam. The wisdom of the day advised that it would be best for Erica's adjustment if she was completely immersed in the school and have no contact with her family for three or four months. She was five years old. We know now, of course, however well meant that philosophy was, it could be extremely damaging to the child and the family. My mother said that Erica was a different child after she went away to school. She went from being a happy, social, and curious child to being withdrawn and standoffish. It would be many years before she was comfortable with physical affection. I feel that Erica Erica living away from us for much of the time made me feel like she was a separate part of our family. I remember my mom buying new clothes for Erica for the new school year and putting iron-on name tags in each piece. We didn't have much money and my mom would alter Erica's clothes to fit me. I was quite skinny and Erica was not and I can still remember standing on a chair wearing Erica's clothes as my mom measured and pinned. My parents often struggled with what would be best for Erica, and there was no parenting manual that fit our family situation. My father wanted to protect her and keep her safe at home, and my mother thought Erica needed to learn to be as independent as she could. Over the years, there was often tension over these two points of view, and Erica often moved home after trying different situations. It seemed our family would be happy and settled when Erica was happy and settled. We stayed in the US until I was eight years old and then moved back to Ontario so Erica could attend the Ontario School for the Blind, now known as the W. Ross McDonald School in Brantford. Us kids understood that it was difficult to find the right place for Erica, whether as a student or later as an adult. I was a quiet kid and very aware that we were special, a kind of special that was awkward and sometimes uncomfortable. I remember feeling resentful that our family activities made adjustments for Erica, yet I also remember quickly coming to her defense whenever anyone made disparaging remarks about her or to her. Kids can be mean. As a gawky teenager, I became very self-conscious about our family's specialness, and it wasn't until later that I came to realize other families had special members too. That helped me feel a little less odd. In the 50s and 60s and even 70s, many people with a disability were hidden away. We were out there trying to make life normal. We were often stared at and whispered about and sometimes that made me cringe. I wanted to blend in and disappear. In 1972, tragedy struck our family when my 16 year old brother was killed in a car accident. 
I was 13. My parents were devastated, overcome with grief, and struggling with maintaining a farm and raising their remaining four children. There were no support groups or grief counselors and nothing to be done but to carry on as best one could. My mother was very close to my brother, and even though they often fought, they also had a very strong bond. My father had been diagnosed with MS a couple of years earlier, and I think that my mother was able to share some of her concerns about her husband and her disabled daughter with my brother. Our family was never the same. Erica also struggled with how and where she fit in. She lived at OSB and would come home lots of weekends, summers, and holidays. It was always sad when she had to go back. I would go with our mom into Erica's dorm and help get her resettled. The ride home was often quiet and sometimes my mom cried softly looking out the window. It was a sad and lost feeling. As Erica got older, it became evident that school was getting too hard and OSB was not able to accommodate her needs. She had trouble finding classrooms when the school switched to a rotation system, and her short-term memory loss made it very difficult for her to remember where she had to go. She became very frustrated and angry. At home, my parents were struggling with what next, and it felt like Erica's needs were foremost and a huge challenge. Finding her a good fit was an ongoing discussion and the undertone of many decisions. I remember feeling confused about Erica's varying degrees of ability. It seemed she could remember some things some days, but not others. She can read braille and play the flute by ear, but couldn't learn other things that seem quite basic. She still has times where she is far more capable than others, and I have to be tuned in to where she's at at any given time. I remember when I was six or seven years old, wondering if she was only pretending to be blind. It seemed impossible somehow. To this day, she doesn't know the way around my house despite being there thousands of times. In one of many training sessions she's had for new equipment or technology, it was discovered that Erica needs to repeat a pattern 27 times for it to become lodged in her long-term memory and must be repeated the same way each time. Once she knows something, she knows it very well. She's a computer nerd and loves learning about the latest inventions, especially pertaining to devices to help the visually impaired. Things like that show me what might have been, and I sometimes think she's a brilliant person trapped inside a broken brain. She remembers trivia from our childhood that escapes me, like the addresses and telephone numbers of every house we ever lived in. She remembers the dates of our grandparents' deaths and their ages, but she can't remember if she had lunch today. I remember some years ago, I was helping Erica get ready to go to camp for a week, something she's been doing for most of her life. She was to have done her laundry and begin packing her suitcase. When I got to her apartment, the laundry was almost done and she had the empty suitcase on the bed. She couldn't think what should go in the suitcase, but, had she, but she had been listening to an audio book about dinosaurs and did I think dinosaurs would ever come back? I had had a hectic day and was tired and wanted to get this done quickly. I became exasperated for we had had the discussion about dinosaurs multiple times in the last couple of weeks. It was her current interest. I wanted to say, if you think would think as much about packing as you do about dinosaurs, you'd know what to pack. I bit my tongue. Such is how Erica's mind works. Her short-term memory deficit means our conversations are often like those with someone with dementia repeated questions, stories, and comments, and it's been more than 40 years. I have to give her explanations over and over in order for her to remember, but then there are other times, sweet times, when she gets it. She gets me, a sister indeed. My parents took Erica to faith healers only to come home disappointed. I can't imagine how that was for Erica, like there's something so wrong with you that only a miracle can fix you. Yet my parents, urged on by others, felt they were doing the best thing for her. They dearly wanted her to be happy and find fulfillment. She went through a very dark time in her teens as she realized she was different and felt she was denied so many things. She hated her life and I couldn't blame her. It was a confusing time for me and I didn't always know how to be with Erica. 
As the eldest child in the family, it was very hard for Erica when her younger siblings started doing things that she didn't. Driving, dating, applying for college, getting married. In the years of college and getting married, I was more distant from Erica and my parents' concerns for her, but always had the sense that she would be a big part of my life. I remember telling my then fiance, tongue in cheek, that Erica and I were a package deal. My mother, knowing my soft heart, was concerned I would eventually take on too much responsibility for Erica's happiness and that I would have to find a balance between the needs of my own family and Erica. Finding that balance can still be a challenge. As I got older, I was sometimes envious of women who had, quote, normal sisters. Women who go away on a sister's weekend and share stories and laughs about kids and jobs and spouses and life. I felt lonely when I imagined the camaraderie and support sisters offered each other. Sisters who could help out when life was hard, when kids were sick or troublesome, or jobs frustrating. Sisters who know your heart, both your struggles and your strengths, and love you anyway. I imagine sisters who, who could help you with an ailing mother or a widowed father, someone who would help problem solve and share the load of work and worry. I have a very supportive and loving family, but only one sister. Sometimes I resented that my sister seemed so needy. I felt I could never give as much as she would take. She would love to have more of my time and attention, and I learned that like anyone, she can be manipulative. All families have their struggles, and I know there are many families of siblings who don't help out, who are hurtful or selfish. Sisters who are absent with no apology or explanation or any sense that they should be contributing to the needs of the family. That is also difficult. I also at times feel guilty and undeserving. Guilty that I don't have Erica's struggles and guilty that I can more easily have what she would love to have. A loving husband, the ease to come and go as I please, the ability to provide for my family, the ability to help others. Sometimes she is very aware of how the scales are tipped and often wishes she could help me as much as I help her. Sometimes I feel helpless when she develops more health issues, issues that threaten her hard-earned independence and send her into despair. I rail at God and my sense of injustice at her plight overwhelms me. God, the creator and great physician, could prevent these illnesses from developing, but he doesn't, and my faith is challenged. My anger is not only because of what this means for Erica, but what it means for me. More time learning about and teaching Erica to manage new procedures, diet, medications. More time, more patience, more endurance. When our father was 85 years old, we decided as a family to make a last trip to the Netherlands. Our parents had immigrated to Canada after World War II and had made several return trips, but this would be a farewell trip for our dad. There was much discussion as to whether Erica would come along. To take her along would mean one of us, me, would spend most of our time assisting her. Dad would also need a fair amount of assistance. He had lived with MS for over 40 years, was able to walk slowly with a walker. Stairs were almost impossible, and we took along a wheelchair for this trip. So we were three able-bodied people out of five. I spoke with friends who know our family very well, people who know how much assistance Erica needs, perspective. Lots of good feedback, but nothing felt right for us. Someone suggested we take along a caregiver, but after much back and forth, we decided to go with the five of us and we would make it work. Erica has never grasped how much help it takes to keep her in the game, so to speak. So to take along a caregiver would seem unnecessary and insulting to her. There is always tension between being honest and being kind. I am learning how to advocate for her rather than decide for myself what's best for her. Over the years, I have learned how to support her in a way that gives her more independence and allows her to live the type of life that brings her more fulfillment. We make many decisions together and figure out how to make it work. Again, it's finding the balance of how much time and energy I give her. I still find that challenging and feel I could always do more. 
Because of her memory loss and developmental disability, there are many practical day-to-day -day life skills that she struggles to manage. I support her with her banking and medical needs, along with various other things that come up. It can be challenging to make arrangements for things outside of her routine because she can't remember, which she finds so frustrating. For example, if I'm going to pick her up to go out for lunch, I call to remind her, confirm the time, and ask her to call Community Living to let them know. Community Living also provides support. Then she calls me back to confirm. Usually she remembers, sometimes not. It would be easier for me to make all the arrangements myself, which I sometimes do, but she wants to do things for herself as much as she can. Supporting Erica will be for the rest of our lives, and sometimes that weighs heavily on me. Her needs will naturally increase over time, and none of us knows how our lives will play out. She has expressed her fear of living longer than I, recognizing that my support adds so much enjoyment to her life. We have developed a level of mutual trust and dependence over the years. She ama is amazed that I can remember things like when her bills are due to be paid, when her appointments have to be booked, and how I can notice and replace household items that wear out. All the day-to-day -day life activities we do. I've had to learn how to advocate for her and with her rather than be a substitute decision maker, and sometimes it feels like a big responsibility. I would not be who I am without my sister. For better or worse, I have learned a lot from her about perseverance, compassion, and about making assumptions about people. I learned more about what equality and justice means. Erica has far more abilities than some people assume, but also more disabilities than some people assume. Her special needs are not immediately evident, and it takes time and patience to discover her strengths and her gifts. She is one of the strongest people I know. Sharing these thoughts with you has been a journey of examining my past and coming to grips with how I remember our family dynamic. It has helped me appreciate my parents' experience and I think it has helped me understand more clearly my relationship with my sister. I'd like to end with a quote by the author Anne Lamott. She is writing about the exercise of writing, but her words struck a chord with me as I was working on this presentation. And I quote, your three-year-old and your work in progress teach you to give. They teach you to get outside of yourself and become a person for someone else. This is probably the secret to happiness. In a sense, I've become that person for Erica. And even though life is hard sometimes and we lose patience with each other or are disappointed in each other, we share a very special happiness. Thank you. That's the end of my story. I hope you enjoyed it. At this time, we're going to break out into chat rooms. And I would like to start with the first one. I'm going to give you this question. Please share a concern or joy you have looking to the future of your life with your disabled sibling or other loved one. You'll have about four minutes and then we'll come back. Thank you. everyone and welcome back. I hope you had a good few minutes to talk together. Um, I think Becky asked you to load some comments into chat and I'll just share some of those. I see one from Liz Solomon's earlier about amazing that dad could walk at a walk with 85. Yeah, it really was amazing and he refused to get in a wheelchair. He said, once I'm in a chair, I'll never get out. Uh, but he did have what's called non-progressive MS, so his experience was quite different from the typical MS patient, I think. If I may, uh, Brenda, I have a question for you, or I think it's a question. How have you seen that looking after your sister, how has that molded you in ways to what kind of a person you are today? Um, I think it has made me a much more compassionate person um, and taught me to look beyond the um, first impression of someone to find out who they are rather than just make assumptions by how they appear. Um, it's also made me really appreciate 
other people um, outside of the Christian community. Once I got involved with the board with community living, I was amazed at the compassion I saw, um, the love that workers have for the clients they work for. And uh, that was such a refreshment for me because we tend to think of the Christian community kind of being more geared that way, but I'd have to say it really opened my eyes to, to others and to appreciate that. I learned from them about compassion and care and patience. Hmm. Yeah. Robin shares a concern about who will take care of the person after the caregiver is gone was shared. Um, that's, that's Erica's big concern. She's um, four years older than me and she hopes that she dies before I do. <laughs> and actually I do too, but I have three daughters and uh, they have already talked about how they will take my place if anything happens to me. And um, which I think is lovely, but I also have concerns about that for their lives, how that will impact them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like she'll be in good hands. I know that's a big concern for parents of children with uh, disabilities that, you know, what's going to happen. Here's a a question from Elsine Versteig. As a sibling yourself, do you have advice to me as a parent of a child with severe disabilities, nonverbal, nonverbal, nonmobile, delayed intellectual, who also has three other children, ages three to nine, special needs child is seven? Wow. Um, advice. I know my mom tried to include all of us in the story of what was happening with Erica without putting too much onto us. And um, so that we grew up kind of knowing the responsibilities that they had for Erica's care and yet encouraging us to go and do our own thing. Like, don't feel you shouldn't move away or, or you know, go off to college or whatever. Um, yeah, that was just kind of what I, I learned from my parents. Liz Solomon says, God knows all things and will provide. That's how I see it. It's true. It's true. It's sometimes hard to trust that others will take as good a care as you think you want them cared for. But it's also a great blessing to see other people step in and offer care in a different way that is just as beneficial and just as good as the care you provide yourself. I know sometimes I, I can be too much there, I, especially at church. If I step back and let Erica go, other people will get her a cup of coffee and other people will talk to her and and it's good to let other people in. So I think we'll wrap up that part and go into our second chat. And this question is, um, please share a strategy you have found to be helpful in encouraging family dynamics. And I would like to expand that to not just family dynamics, but your church family or your neighborhood community. And we'll, I think we can give that four minutes as well, Becky. Thank you. Well, Brenda, in our little breakaway group, we kind of forgot what your question was. So, But we did work on some strategies that we felt was important. That's great. And one of them was, which may be difficult, is for the caregiver to be able to let go and allow someone else to step in because there are other people who would love to step in to help. And uh, yeah, not only are we putting a lot of pressure on ourselves, but we're also denying the opportunity for other people to be a caregiver. That's right. That's right. So important. And important for the person with a disability to recognize that there are other people who can come alongside.
So if anybody has any more comments that they want to put into chat about what they discussed, that's great. Um, and we do, while you're doing that, I do want to share one thing. Um, I already can see this. This is our, this is our next book club book. And it's very exciting. So it's The Courage for Caregivers, Sustenance for the Journey, um, in company with Henry J. M. Nowen. So um, over the course of November, um, Carolyn, who is our regional advocate from Classes Chatham, um, is going to be partnering with me and we're going to be leading a book club together. And it really is just, um, you know, I feel like this session has really brought us together for some very important conversations. And then this just, I feel, is the next step is joining this book club. Um, there is a website that I'm hoping that you've all been connecting to for all the recordings that we've been having and the notes that have been following up. And I'll, pl I'll put that into the chat in a minute. But on that uh, website, if you go to the very last page, it says book club. And there's a form. You need to you need to sign up for it um, through that form, or just by emailing me. I know that I've been communicating with everybody, so you should have my email, bjones at crcna.com.org. Um, and I'm just uh, excited for this. We have limited space, so make sure if you're interested in participating with this that you do. It's going to be um, four weeks in November, and we'll be sending out all the information to everybody that signs up. And now I'm going to turn it. Um, Back over to Brenda if you have any more wrap up conversations before Lena takes the, the lead. Uh, in the chat, Diane Plug shared that a strategy she uses, she has an adult son with disabilities. She said, every three years I ask to attend the deacons in our church and share with them the kinds of things I do for my son that the church can assist with at the time I'm no longer here. With Christian Horizon support and the church, I pray my son will be looked after which is a great example of drawing other people into the support circle. And Mark shares, Mark has, his oldest daughter has severe multiple disabilities. And over the years when our family was growing up, my wife was diligent about reminding the other kids about specific opportunities we had as a family, thanks to our oldest daughter, such as Shriners picnics and make a wish. <laughs> so there you go, take advantage of those special things. I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you to everyone that uh, stopped in to listen. And thank you, Brenda, for your presentation. I think some of that really has opened has opened my eyes, and I'm sure some of the other people as well that have joined in. And thank you for joining in today. And uh, yeah, this is our was our third session. Next week, on the fourth session of walking alongside caregivers, we will have Marlene van Rutselaar, who will speak to us on parenting children and adults with disabilities. Sounds like that could be something that we might want to be part of. And if you have someone that you know might be interested in that subject, invite them as well. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us at this time. Thank you for enabling us to share with each other the challenges and also the joys that we experience as caregivers. Bless each caregiver so that they, in turn, may be a blessing to those for whom they care. And bless each of us as we proceed along the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank See you, you next week. Bye-bye.